welcome to Outside the Wall, a selection of recordings from a group assignment for the uh, Understanding Personality course at the University of Toronto. My name is Eagle Dex, and I'm joined by my friends Raim and Wally. Hello. Hello. And today we're going to be discussing a film called Secret Wedding, or Boda Secreta, as I'm sure Raim will insist on calling it. <laughs> Not in that pronunciation, though a lesser known uh, Latin American film from the 90s. The way that we came to this film is that our teacher, uh, Professor Jordan Peterson, really liked it, so we thought we'd get extra credit if we talked about it. And without any further ado, we'll go into uh, Wally's discussion of the film. Well, first of all, I, I don't insinuate that Peterson is my teacher, but uh, speak for yourself with that. But um, so this film, uh, for me, definitely, I think needs a rewatch, particularly because I know this is tied in somewhat to Argentinian politics and history. That uh, when this film takes place, so generally, this it start the movie starts with this guy who wakes up buck naked, roaming through the streets of I think it's Buenos Aires, um, and he completely has lost all recollection of who he is, what he was, and the police eventually, or the authorities eventually um, get a hold of him, put some clothes on him, and kind of tell him to, you know, go out and find a life. And I think throughout the film, he winds up traveling back to his uh, hometown, or where he had met his lover, uh, who had according to what he was told by the bus driver that was taking him there is still waiting for him. But when the twist is when he shows up, the woman doesn't recognize him at all. Now, I think there's a span of about 12 or 13 years between when he disappeared in 76, I think, and when he woke up again in, uh, I think is whenever the film comes out is 89 or 88. Um, so it's kind of this recollection and trying him trying to force his lover to remember who he is and try and uh, rekindle that relationship while at the same time dealing with some of the corruption and government forces that uh, took place in Argentina during this time period, which is encapsulated with, uh, in this movie, at least the Catholic Church with the local priest who seems to be very corrupt and is kind of pulling the strings of the town and all the townsfolk. So uh, overall, I, I definitely, like I said, I need a rewatch for this, especially because I want to maybe dig a little bit deeper into the politics of Argentina uh, at the time, because I don't even begin to speak on my knowledge of or lack of knowledge in this particular area. So. I think those are my thoughts for now, so. Okay, so this was our second film in our Argentine Fortnite, also like Argentine Canadian production since this film was also produced by Canada, like our previous mm -hmm. film, The Dark Side of the Heart, La Oscuro del Corazón. And uh, I personally prefer <laughs> Dark Side of the Heart, but I thought this was a good, very good film, and uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, like Wally says, he, there's, uh, he does wake up in Buenos Aires and he had gone into hiding because of the political uh, persecutions that were, were going in the 70s. Uh, there was this time of dictatorship in Argentina. Um, also, not as, I wouldn't say I was well versed in Argentine history, but uh, I do know about a, lot, a bit about it. This is, uh, I would say, the. <laughs> This archetypical story of a Latin American country going through a period of a bit of civil war, dictatorship, and then through a period of rough democracy. Uh, for me, wakes up in a time when there, the country is back into democracy. However, there's still the influence of the previous war government and uh, some of the uh, fears that are reigning. Since when he goes back to the rural town where he was from to find his uh, beloved uh, Tota and she doesn't recognize him he is still very worried about his he, he doesn't take back his previous identity he takes on a new one and uh the town itself is still living like in a, a bit of a bubble let's say like if they're still uh hunting for 
communists and uh, uh, dealing against the left. And it's, it's very conservative because they're being influenced by the priests of this town. So that, that's something that I would say that is still going on today in many of our countries and towns in Latin America. So it's, it, for me, himself has to struggle with trying to rekindle that relationship with his beloved Tota and also uh, juggling the fact that he doesn't want to be exposed by the, the people because they they, see, they believe that he may be like a communist in disguise or something. There's a, a scene where the the restaurant where Fermin is play, now playing the piano for every night. The priests and uh, like the, let's say the, the top colors of the town start trying to plan how to oust him as a, a Russian spy and they, uh, they just send this guy to tell him a few lines in Russian and for me just like tells him to just flips him off and and they're like oh do you see how he reacted he's a communist for sure and and uh, it's it's uh, it was something that I would say that was very common and also from what I know also in history in um, my country the, uh, there were some people that has there were cases that had gone to Russia to study and when they came back they were be being ousted because they were seen as communists even if they didn't necessarily share the opinion of it they just, the simple fact of being associated by a, a scholarship program had uh, tainted them and uh, I thought that was very well done the ending itself is uh, more bitter than sweet uh, for me is is arrested and uh, he doesn't really get to Tota. It's, it's like a cycle going back again where Tota had fallen in love with and he uh, reborn for me, I think, as Wally would see him. And uh, she uh, shouts at him as he goes away on the bus that she'll be waiting for him. But uh, who knows if everything will happen again. But yeah, I thought it was uh, it's quite a touching film, and I think we can go ahead then with Evil Dex with his stuff. Okay, so just to begin with a warning, if Wally's description of the protagonist wandering through Buenos Aires in the nude sounded in any way titillating to you, I think you'll be disappointed if you look up the film for that reason. Now, I, I, I didn't um, get too much out of the romance and character drama in this movie, particularly, but I think that uh, what I did get, what Professor Peterson found in it, I think what I found in it as well was the cyclical nature of the sort of totalitarian regime that's depicted in the film, wherein um, the, character, the main character is trying to come out of it and recover and move back into like a more um, liberal life, let's say. And he's unable to do so because he doesn't fully understand sort of the mechanisms of everything like this. He's just, in, a, in general, inadequate to stop it. That part of the story, I think, is quite interesting and uh, fairly well achieved in, within the film, although it maybe is a little bit on the long and slow side. And it's definitely a very good case study. Something I appreciate is that it's a very good case study in um, how Latin America is doomed to barbarity and ignorance. So I like, enjoyed that a lot. And that's all I'll say. Ooh, that's a little controversial, I think. <laughs> I was gonna say, Raym, do you have a retort to that? <laughs> no, I, I already see my country as a failed state, so. <laughs> yeah, I think Raym's retort is you're absolutely right. I'm getting the hell out of here and going to Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, <laughs> it's a, a bit of a tangent I say, but uh, I feel it's sad in that our countries are so culturally and naturally rich, but uh, politically and socially corrupt and damaged. Yeah, it's a long history of it, and, and but, but that may be another point that we can discuss later on. In the... Well, I do think it is a good kind of uh, example of how something like democracy doesn't necessarily start overnight, uh, and it's not depending on particularly on the culture and the country that you're in. Uh, it's not, I think, uh, many people particularly in the West, and especially in a post 9-11 environment, take for granted uh, how democracy works in their countries and how it got there and just make assumptions, particularly if you're of the neoconservative bent, 
that if you set up a dem democratic government in some place uh, that uh, your job is done and you can kind of wash your hands and be rid of it and as we know from history both recent and otherwise that's not necessarily the case and i think this film definitely shows it in how uh, just because a place like buenos aires which is very urban and cosmopolitan may seem like it's in uh, embracing democracy or democratic values when you go out into sort of the rural areas and the areas that are less touched by the sort of cosmopolitan view or mindset that that isn't the case at all and i think this film definitely showcases it and how in addition, how powerful the Catholic Church was and in some countries still is, particularly in Latin America. Yeah, the priest himself is quite the leading figure in the, the way he, let's say, brainwashes even people into thinking that some people are just the enemies of the state and, well, the town and thus the state, how they must not be allowed to go on or how they're corruptors of not necessarily just... Uh, just like the, the good values and the such, let's say, in uh, in towns, and um, also the expression that even as you mentioned that democracy democracy doesn't come on, uh, just up show up overnight. And the fact that it may also like regress the the fact that it, is, it has been done so. Uh, I think the if, if I get the example of uh, of the probably most well known Central American hero. Uh, regarding democracy would be Francisco Morazan. The Morazanic dream of him was like actually to unite the these uh, cent ten cent five Central American countries into a single one state, Central America State Federation. And uh, he is so um, the it says so that he was uh, when he was fusilated in Costa Rica. He said that uh, his, the uh, the love of Central America died with him. And uh, I think it's uh, quite powerful to see the, the fact that most of Central America is pretty damaged to date. And uh, ironically, to one hit, I, I find it ironically the fact that Costa Rica it may be the Central American country that is doing so the best in terms of democracy. And the, where the place where he was actually uh, uh, fusilated, executed. And um, they are actually the only, I believe, the only Central American country that has no uh, military force. They disbanded it years ago, so that's uh, the contrary to what I say when I leave him. But yeah, uh, <laughs> Evil Dex, I don't know if there's something else here, or you want us to keep on going about democratic structures. <laughs> Perhaps uh, mention something else that we've both seen. Perhaps uh, regarding the the Galactic Heroes and how they expose the sides of. Uh, pros and cons of an authoritarian and, demo and also a democratic regime fighting against each other. Evil Dex? Yeah, that's a um, very different story, I would say, because um, I think with Secret Wedding, we can say that it works based on essentially the presupposition that democracy is better than authoritarian stuff, um, which is basically the presupposition, if you would even call it that, at most people in general are working with at this point. So Legend of the Galactic Heroes is interesting in that it even um, takes the time to ask that question of whether or not democracy really is the best form of government. And it does, I think, a quite an admirable job of um, giving a kind of even-handed uh, portrayal of that subject matter where the pros and cons of both sides are clearly visible. Um, uh, like you can see in the alliance or the um i forget the names the democratic government that is often ruled by for example the need to get reelected yep. it becomes interest over um actually doing things that are effective or correct and there's a sort of a lazy cabal of um fairly entrenched politicians who aren't actually helpful to anybody except for themselves things like that contrasted against like uh, i would say the biggest both strength and weakness of authoritarian systems, how they really, or just the strength or weakness of the dictator himself or the, the empire. And Legend of the Galactic Hero starts out with this complacent old, like sort of rotting dynasty and isn't very effective at all at that point and then kind of becomes better when uh, Reinhardt takes power, but obviously can't really last without him. Yeah, that's uh, 
the plant land does give on that effect of the how there can also be a problem of uh, perpetual re-election and uh, what it brings up, which I mentioned, a more complacent government that's uh, trying just to gain the people's approval of democracy, but uh, not actually doing anything to really improve their situation, just like, keep up the morale, yeah, mm -hmm. keep, what's the word, like, um, appeal to their patriotism, let's say, rather yeah. than uh, their well-being. Yeah, I think we can kind of relate it to parts of the system of the European Union at this point in history, actually, because I think I'm not very well versed on this, but I'm pretty sure there are certain people in the um, European Parliament, like Jean-Claude Junkers, I think is one of the big examples, who have very little actual um, democratic support from like the overall population of Europe. Like that guy basically just gets elected by a very small portion of the Belgian voter base and then is able to sort of affect large changes on the world in general with no real risk of um, failing to regain his seat because he's mostly backed up by a cabal of groups who appoint him within the actual structure of the EU itself. Well, yes, I mean, that's even, you could say that's the same in most countries, including my country, the United States, where you essentially have the same career politicians who have been in office for decades and who get in not necessarily because they are popular, but because they simply have the means, whether it's through wealth or through connections, to prop themselves up and get reelected. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Joe the... Biden is actually a good example of this, too, that's visible for people right now, because it seems to me like he is... Um... He's in the position that he's in more because of his status within the Democratic Party, really, really rather than actually being popular. Yes, it, and of course, this goes to this very uh, trite expression that I hate in American politics, which is electability. And that, that's the calculus that's used, rather than someone who can actually make any changes or make changes that are positive or necessary, it's, well, are they electable or not? Because... Part of it's because of the way the country was founded and that it had to be a compromise between the original 13 colonies and that's kind of just kept going since the country's founding. And the fact that the country is so massive and so large and so diverse that it's almost begs to have that sort of, um, in Chomsky's words, almost one party state. Yeah, that's how. Uh... <laughs> now we're focusing more on the Processing the uh, biggest cons that we've gone through with our democratic governments. Well, so, uh, I would say that in your case, it's more democratic than where I am. But uh, I found it always amusing how I, the previous election over here, the, during the voting process, the incumbent, because uh, the constitution prohibits re-election actually, but our current president dictator forced his way in through some strange loophole that I don't even know how he's standing, but in any case, he was actually losing in the during the elections when they were counting, and then there was this uh, coincidental uh, system uh, crash, and then that lasted for hours, and then when he was back up, he was winning. So, <laughs> what do you know, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I would say that that's I don't have to say this on a, something that's going to be aired publicly. Like, <laughs> should you be worried the secret police? <laughs> I think I'm fine. Um, well, okay. may, maybe changing the subject a bit. Um, what were your guys' thoughts on the relationship between our the main character and his love interest? Because for me, I had mentioned this offline. I had thought that at least gave me the suggestion that he might have been reincarnated as a different person because the fact that yes it is 13 years or however many years the fact that she didn't even recognize him just by looks or even just by some of his mannerisms or the things he said to me was a little odd i found to suggest that it was just the same guy it's just time had caused that forgetfulness well i would say that um for me it was a bit old by the time he returned. I, I've noticed that change in people during 13 years that they're significantly different. 
Uh, I also remember the fact that uh, Fermin had been underground for all that time, so he probably didn't get like a, by my not a, a really healthy lifestyle. So that must have probably like aged him a bit more or something. Uh, the other thing is that uh, Tota is described by the, uh, the townspeople as being basically like mentally ill because she she's pretty much the called like the town crazy woman. And uh, the fact is that she, she, it is very likely that she has also been affected. Like uh, she has fixated on the younger version of Fermin. Probably like uh, she, uh, it, it's become a part of her um, condition. So I, I would imagine it's more a, 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 a bit of a mix of those things those factors that she didn't really recognize him. She has been affected by all the time away. And uh, yeah. the fact that she's also a bit isolated from the rest of the townspeople, not many really treated her like a, a person that uh, could, you could talk to, right? more like a crazy woman. And the, uh, what I mentioned for me, so. Okay, yeah, so Wally is um, arguing for this interpretation that he's been sort of literally resurrected within the context of the story rather than just being like lost underground for a long time and coming back up and i didn't um take that interpretation independently when i was watching it but i have no problem with it you can um it's so like the fact that he's you know wandering through Buenos Aires naked uh that is commonly used as a sort of symbolic way to indicate rebirth and it can either be a literal or a metaphorical rebirth because when he's coming back to the world after years of isolation with a degree of amnesia that kind of constitutes a so-called rebirth of its own sense. So I would say that it's ambiguous, but it also doesn't really matter. Yes, and I guess maybe part of my bias too is that I, a lot of my experience with Latin American fiction delves into some sort of magical realism, which I, that was what I took out of this, is that this was the magical realist aspect of the movie is the fact that he was reincarnated mm -hmm. yeah that's something like magical realism is much less visible in this film than it is in uh the dark side of the heart which we discussed previously so what you can kind of argue for that little like as element of it but otherwise it's not really present indeed but i can see it yeah i can I can see that's one way to interpret it and his being the manner of it for which the doesn't film. It doesn't really matter to the con the narrative of this of the film at all. So, well, it might if we're talking about how this is supposed to be like a cyclical story, and how at the end of the film it seems things are already starting to repeat themselves, and how Tota is you know following screaming after the bus like she was mm -hmm. told in the beginning, saying like I'll never forget you, I'll wait here for you, and it seems just to me like the cycles continue that you know maybe he'll get whacked again and he'll, he'll show up another 10 years later as, in a, as a different body and a different person. Yeah, well, I'm not going to drag it down too much, but I think that kind of cyclical nature can come in whether the resurrection is real or not, because it can be repeated again with him just getting tortured, say, for 10 years and then um, coming out amnesiac again and her having forgotten him again. Maybe she just doesn't have a very good memory. <laughs> Well, memory breaks down with time, too, so... Yeah, so his chances of being remembered are even lower each time. That's sad. Sadly, yes. Uh, um, I would say that, uh, at least for me, he's quite a persistent lover. He was still very much uh, trying to rekindle his relationship with Tata, despite uh, the situations and the odds apparently against his favor because he was in a way competing against himself the uh, younger version of Fermin that Tota had in his mind in her mind but uh yeah shame well uh yeah I mean that's pretty much all I'll, I have to kind of contribute mm -hmm. unfortunately I think it's fine to call it here. So uh, as a last remark, I want to say that if we've made this film sound overly heady or inaccessible, that's probably a false impression. I, it may help to um, understand 
a lot about Argentine history when you're watching this film, but I definitely don't think it's necessary. I think it can be um, mostly divorced from its uh, Latin American trappings and understood as a sort of general uh, meditation on some of these political ideas and just the elements of human nature that lead to repetition of mistakes. And I think in that light, it's definitely worth your time and you could do much worse when selecting a film to watch. So this has been Outside the Wall. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.